So, muscle me mechanism, mechanics, and metabolism. We were just talking about the action potential and how it triggers muscle contraction. So let's review those steps. You have an action potential from the somatic motor neuron, which releases acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft and binds to the acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate. The ligand gated acetylcholine receptor is a cation channel, meaning that it allows positive ions to flow into the cytoplasm of the muscle cell and it also allows positive ions to flow out of the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. The net entry of sodium into the cell is greater than the positive ions leaving the cell and this leads to a depolarization, a local end plate potential at that site. This end plate potential then spreads from the site of the neuromuscular junction to the vicinity, uh, the close vicinity where there are sodium gated or sodium channels that are voltage gated. When these cells encounter the local depolarization, they open, allowing sodium to trigger action potentials in the skeletal muscle that action potential can then travel along the muscle cell membrane through the transverse tubular network where it encounters the dihydropyridine receptors, the DHP receptors, which will then move and open the RYR, ryanidine receptors. This allows calcium to be uh, ejected or to travel down its concentration gradient from the inside or lumen of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. That calcium can bind to troponin and allows actin-myosin binding because calcium binding to troponin allows tropomyosin to move away from myosin binding sites on the thin filament. The action of the myosin is to pull actin towards the center of the sarcomere and as the sarcomere shorten, the myofibril shorten which means the muscle shortens. In terms of relaxation, after the action potentials have ended, calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, clearing the cytoplasm, allowing troponin and tropomyosin to move so that they are now in a blocking position on the thin filament, which inhibits the interaction of myosin. So, here you have the first three steps. You have acetylcholine being released from the nerve terminal, diffusing across the cleft, binding to the uh, acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate. Sodium can now flow into the motor end plate cytoplasm, cytoplasmic region. Potassium can flow out. However, more sodium flows in than potassium flowing out, causing a local depolarization. That spread of the end plate potential to the periphery of the neuromuscular junction engages sodium channels, voltage gated sodium channels, on the muscle cell membrane. The opening of these channels triggers a muscle cell action potential, which can then propagate towards both ends of the uh, muscle cell. That action potential moves along the sarcolemma. When it encounters transverse tubule, it goes through the, sarco, uh, the transverse tubule, through the center of the muscle cell, all the way through to the other side, causing the movement of dihydropyridine receptors, DHP. The DHP receptor movement then triggers the opening of the calcium release channel, RYR. The opening of the ryanidine receptor channel allows calcium to flow down its concentration gradient from the lumen of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm and then bind to troponin on the thin filaments. The binding of the calcium to troponin allows the movement of tropomyosin which then uncovers the myosin binding sites on the thin filament. The cross bridges from the myosin molecules will interact with their binding sites on the actin thin filament 
and execute their power stroke. Remember that these cross bridges are pre-charged with the energy of ATP hydrolysis, and as they make this movement, they release ADP and phosphate into the cytoplasm. This is our contraction cycle, which is powering this process. So you have binding to the thin filament, you have release of phosphate, and beginning of the power stroke. At the end of the power stroke, you will lose ADP, and ATP can rebind to the cross bridge and then re-energize the cross bridge so we can go through another cycle. An important point to think about also is that if, for example, ATP is depleted, what happens to the cell at that state? If there's no more ATP, then the cross bridge that is binding to the uh, thin filament at the end of a contraction cycle is stuck because ATP reduces the affinity of myosin for actin and allows it to release. If you cannot release the cross bridge at the end of the power stroke, then you end up in rigor mortis. And rigor mortis is the stiffness of skeletal muscles after death due to the depletion of ATP supplies. If ATP is present, the muscle can relax. If ATP is not present, the muscle cannot relax and you get rigor mortis. Now it's a combination of a failure of the calcium control systems with the lack of ATP um, and other cellular processes using up all of the ATP that's available uh, in the cytoplasm to reach a state of rigor mortis. But once the, all the ATP supplies are depleted, the myosin cross bridges will bind tightly to actin and they cannot be uh, removed uh, by the binding of a new ATP molecule. This is why rigidity of muscle can be used in forensics to determine approximately time of death. If you know the environment where the body was found, then you know, uh, you can calculate the probability of how long it would take for the muscle cells to use up their ATP supply. And if rigor mortis has found, that sets a time window for when that process, the death occurred that led to rigor mortis being found in the body. Eventually, after a long period of time, uh, degradative processes start to cause the muscles to uh, break down. The proteins start to denature, and that will allow rigor to break, or the limbs become movable again. And that also, that process takes a certain amount of time. It's also temperature dependent, but it can be used to help determine time of death. So. If you see or hear about someone determining time of death based on the formation of rigor mortis, it's because of the interaction of actin and myosin and the uh, use of ATP to reduce the affinity of myosin for actin at the end of the power stroke. Now we talked about the sliding filament mechanism. This contraction cycle powering the interaction of myosin and actin leads to the sliding of the thin filaments past the thick filaments and the shortening of the sarcomere for force development. The relaxation process involves this calcium ATPase pump that is in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it pumps um, calcium from the cytoplasm into the lumen of the sarcoplasmic reticulum against a concentration gradient. In order to do this, you need ATP to provide energy, and that means that you need ATP for relaxation to pump calcium. You need ATP for power. Myosin hydrolyzes ATP to generate the, or to extract the energy that it uses to power uh, for muscle contraction, and at the end of the cross bridge cycle, you need ATP to release myosin and actin so that the myosin 
can embark on another contraction cycle and to ensure that the muscle does not go into rigor mortis. This cartoon is meant to describe what happens during muscle contraction and that is you get shortening of the sarcomeres which shorten the myofibrils which shorten the muscles. So let's flip back and forth. When you contract you shorten the myofibrils which shorten the muscle. This is because the sarcomere gets shorter, the myofibrils get shorter, the muscle gets shorter. Now we talked about the types of muscle contraction in the lab, but let's revisit those issues. There are two primary types of contraction. One is isometric, the other is isotonic. Isometric is, uh, as I've mentioned before, the oxymoron of muscle contraction. Oxymoron meaning this, this statement doesn't make sense. If you have an isometric contraction, iso means same, metric means length, so the same length shortening, same length contraction doesn't make any sense, but it's what physiologists say when a muscle has been activated, whether or not it shortens, the, it is called a contraction. And so, in the case of an isometric contraction, we have an activation of a muscle, but the muscle is not allowed to shorten. That muscle can then build tension. If you think about the situation where you take your two palms in front of your chest and you press your palms together, you can feel that your muscles in your arms are generating tension. However, the muscle position doesn't change. It's an isometric contraction. In this case, we have a muscle attached to a 30 kilogram load and when the muscle is activated, it contracts. It starts to build tension and we can look at the tension developed versus time and find that this muscle develops tension until it reaches its maximum tension level. Unfortunately, this is only 25 kilograms and this, the load is 30 kilograms so the load cannot move. The muscle can generate its maximum tension for a period of time and then once it relaxes, it goes back to the uh, state it was before the contraction. But there's no movement that's occurred and that has been an isometric contraction. Now, what we find is if we have a muscle at a particular length it can generate its maximal force for that length during an isometric contraction. So we're going to say that when you have a resting sarcomere length where all of the myosin cross bridges can interact with an actin thin filament that that is our optimal length our 100 percent level. And when we activate this muscle in an isometric contraction so that it does not shorten from the uh, position that it's in, it activates and it generates maximum force, we'll call that maximum tension. And you can see that there's a short or a small range of lengths where you can change the length and still get that maximum tension development. However, what we find is if we start to stretch the muscle so that we start to pull some of the cross bridges out of the overlap zone, the more we stretch, the less tension is, de is developed. And so you can build this relationship between length and tension based on isometric contractions where the muscle was relaxed, making zero tension, you activated it, and it generated its maximum isometric force for that length, isometric force for the next length and you can build this curve and so when you stretch a muscle so that it decreases the overlap of the thick and thin filaments you decrease the force as you increase the stretch. Now on the other side of this length tension relationship we can see that the force is decreasing but you can't say that the overlap is less than 100 percent. 
if anything, you would say the overlap is more than 100%. But the tension's going down. So why is the tension going down? When a muscle is contracted less than the optimum, our optimum length is here at 100%. When it's less than optimum, you introduce disorder because the filament systems start to interfere with each other within the sarcomere. And when those things happen, when the thin filaments can interfere with filaments from the opposite side of the sarcomere, if the thick filaments start to approach the Z-line, you can get some interference there, cause some thick filament buckling. Um, the introduction of disorder reduces the amount of force. So on the short side of the link tension relationship, we worry about disorder. And on the long side, we worry about overlap of the thick and thin filaments. And this governs how much tension can be generated for any muscle. If you consider the issue where you're picking up something light, like a pen, you don't really pay much attention to the orientation of your limbs because you're strong enough to pick up something that light. But if you are picking up something heavy, you are likely to make yourself more compact, reducing the, over, reducing the stretch of the muscles and trying to reach this sweet spot where you can make maximum forces. Now, the shaded portion of this curve tells you the general range over which our muscles operate, our skeletal muscles operate, and you'll notice that it does not go the full distance of the link tension relationship. The limitation here is our skeleton. The way the muscles are attached to the skeleton limit their range of movement to a very narrow range where at a minimum they make about 80 percent of their optimum force and at a maximum uh, they get stretched to about 20% more than where they could be at optimal length. And this benefits us by keeping our muscles in a range where we can make near normal forces. This link tension relationship will also come into play in the cardiac section when you talk about Starling's Law. because it helps to govern how forcefully your heart will contract based on how much blood has filled it during the uh, return of blood through the venous circulation. Now let's look at an isotonic contraction. Now this is the kind of contraction we did during the lab where the length can change as the contraction proceeds. We take the same muscle and we attach it to a lighter load when we activate the muscle, in this case the muscle can generate more than 20 kilograms and so it can move the load. But note what happens when we measure the tension developed. What you find is that it doesn't go to 25 kilograms, which was its maximum value. It goes to just above 20 kilograms and then it moves the load at that by generating just enough tension to move it and it moves it as fast as it can for that particular load. And so you can also calculate a relationship between the mass that is needed to be lifted and the speed at which that mass can be moved. If we look at twitches that are isotonic, if the load is light, we can move it pretty quickly and we um, and it's just a twitch, so it moves fast and then it relaxes. And if we measure the slope of the line as it increases the movement, as the distance shortened increases, that slope is the velocity of contraction. If we increase the load, the slope decreases, meaning that it moves slower. And if we increase the load again, the slope decreases again, meaning that it moves slower. We can plot the velocity versus load and we get a relationship like this.
Now note it's not a linear relationship, but it is a real relationship of the velocity to the load. When the load is minimal, you get maximum velocity. When the load is the same as the amount of isometric force that you could make for that particular muscle, you get no movement. So zero velocity is equal to isometric. Maximum velocity is what happens at zero load, and you have a curved relationship between those two points. Now, as we discussed in the lab, you can go beyond this. You can, move, you can interact with loads that actually stretch the muscle while it's trying to resist that stretch. Those are called eccentric contractions. And shortening contractions are called concentric contractions. These are also called pleometric pleometric contractions for the eccentric contractions. Pleometric or eccentric contractions are very stimulatory for building of muscle mass and so exercises like the biceps curl where you pull a barbell close to your chest and then you lower it. As you lower it, the biceps maintains tension but is being stretched by the descent of the load and that uh, puts a greater strain on the muscle than just uh, lifting it alone and it stimulates the muscle to try to get stronger. Within any muscle group in the human body, you find a mixture of muscle types. Now, if you think about, say, domestic chickens, we often hear the people refer to red meat, white meat, light meat, dark meat. In chickens, some of the, in these domestic chickens, some of the tissues are specifically fast twitch muscle, which is white, or slow twitch muscle, which is red. In humans, what you find is that in all of our muscle groups, essentially all of our muscle groups, you have a mixture of both the fast and slow, the red and the white muscles. Overall, the tissue will look red because the red color will predominate, but there will be fast twitch muscles embedded within the muscle groups in the human body. On the left here, we have a transverse section of a section of human muscle. Actually, I'm not sure if it's human, but it's certainly from a mammal. And what we're seeing is slow twitch fibers, which are dark, fast twitch fibers, which are white muscle or light, and then some intermediate muscle fibers, which are actually hybrids of fast and slow, called fast oxidative glycolytic. We refer to these muscles based on the speed at which they contract and the type of metabolism that they use. Oxidative fibers use oxidative phosphorylation to generate ATP. Glycolytic fibers use glycolysis. One of the things that you might also notice, especially if you look at this, the image on the right, is that the fast twitch muscles are much thicker than the slow twitch muscles. The slow twitch muscles, because they rely on oxidative phosphorylation, need to be in close proximity to capillaries so that they can get oxygen diffusion across the cell. And if they become too thick, that means that oxygen may have a difficult time diffusing to the center of the cell uh, from the capillary, and that could deprive the cell of its necessary ATP concentrations. So, they're self-limiting in growth to maintain a diameter that allows efficient oxygen diffusion. Remember what you learned with Dr. K, oxygen, or diffusion of any kind is fast over short distances, but its speed does not maintain as you go to longer and longer distances. The reason why the white muscles or the glycolytic fibers can become larger is because they do not rely on the oxidative metabolism, which allows them to increase their size and become stronger by adding myofibrils because they don't have to worry about oxygen diffusion across the cell. So there are some factors that can determine muscle tension. They include 
the action potential frequency, we saw some evidence of that during the lab. The fiber length, we talked about the length tension relationship. The fiber diameter, the larger the cell in diameter, the more cells that are the more force it can generate uh, because each myofibril is a force generating machine. And then finally there is fatigue. Let's talk about some of the things that occur metabolically. Muscle metabolism. Muscle cells can form ATP through three different biochemical pathways. The first is the phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate. The second is oxidative phosphorylation of ADP to ATP in mitochondria. And the third is phosphorylation of ADP by glycolysis in the cytoplasm. Now the first process by phosphorylation of ADP from creatine phosphate is fast. And that's useful because as soon as you start to use the ATP uh, for muscle contraction, that's the supply starts to dwindle and you have more creatine phosphate in your cells than you have ATP. And so there's a ready supply, one step reaction that regenerates the ATP and allows all of the cellular processes that require ATP to work normally. The other two processes require more time, and because you have a fast process that can kick in immediately, it can buy you some time to let the other two processes work. So let's talk about um, these processes and how they contribute to muscle function. You take phosphocreatin, which is the same as creatine phosphate, and ADP, the enzyme creatine kinase, can transfer a phospho, phosphate group, group from phosphocreatin, and you get creatine and ATP. That's what um, most people who take creatine as a supplement are trying to do is increase the concentration of phosphocreatin in their cells. It, taking phosphocreatine as a supplement would not help you. You have to get creatine transported from your digestive tract into your tissues in order to increase the creatine concentration and then you can create phosphocreatine through normal metabolism in your cells. That ATP will be used for not only the contraction at some myosin ATPase but for relaxation with the calcium ATPase and also the sodium potassium ATPase and other cellular processes that require ATP to maintain cellular homeostasis. So when you're at rest, your metabolism will generate ATP and then use the ATP to phosphorylate um, pho creatine to make phosphocreatin. Then when your muscles are working, the process is reversed and the same enzyme is employed to take the phosphocreatin and then phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. So when you first start to exercise, creatine phosphate or phosphocreatin is the storehouse for the high energy phosphate that um, has been accumulated during rest and it can make ATP fairly rapidly because it's only a one-step chemical reaction and replenish your ATP supply but it doesn't last for very long just a few seconds additional to the ATP concentration what the ATP concentration provides in order to regenerate that creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine you need ATP production either through oxidative phosphorylation or glycolysis in oxidative phosphorylation, as the name suggests, you require molecular oxygen. This process is multi-step and it is slower, so it takes longer to kick in than creatine phosphate as a reserve and creatine kinase as the enzyme. However, um, it can uh, generate quite a bit of ATP and it can use a number of fuels. So as you begin your exercise as oxidative phosphorylation starts, it will either use glucose uh, or it will use glucose, but the glucose can come from glycogen or it can come from the blood. Now, the first supply back up in uh, a muscle cell would be the glycogen that's already in the cell, 
which can be broken down to make glucose and then that can feed into glycolysis and the byproducts of glycolysis can go into oxidative phosphorylation and result in ATP production. After that, uh, the glucose in the cell is somewhat depleted and you start to take glucose from the blood supply and it also goes through glycolysis to make ATP. Eventually, fatty acids from the blood are the main fuel for uh, oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP and um, fatty acids are more energy dense than glucose so that you get more ATPs per molecule typically with fatty acids than you do with sugars. Uh, your, your fuel of last resort is proteins breaking down to amino acids and they can also be used to produce ATP but usually only done in, in rare cases of extreme exertion or starvation. However, the important process here is that you need oxygen that's coming from the uh, blood supply. You need a fuel source which can be endogenous as in the glucose that comes from glycogen or the uh, amino acids that come from proteins or that can be exogenous more like fatty acids that are being circulated in the blood and then metabolized in order to produce fuel for oxidative phosphorylation which will generate ATP. As a measuring stick you can think of a glucose being fed through glycolysis and then oxidative phosphorylation generating 36 ATP molecules per glucose molecule and that's quite a bit of a turnover of those carbons in the glucose into ATP molecules as a general purpose fuel. Oxidative pho or phosphorylation, direct phosphorylation of ADP by glycolysis also can make ATP using glycolysis. However, for each glucose molecule it only produces two ATP molecules and that um, is a lot less efficient than oxidative phosphorylation. In the presence of large amounts of glucose, this product process will produce large amounts of ATP. It will also produce some lactate, and that lactate then has to be dissipated from the cells, uh, usually uh, being transported into the circulatory system uh, to be uh, metabolized elsewhere. So these are the mechanisms of ATP regeneration. The first is the phosphorylation of creatine phosphate, also known as phosphocreatine. That is a one-step reaction that regenerates ATP from ADP and uses creatine phosphate as the phosphate donor. The second process here is oxidative phosphorylation. It occurs in the mitochondria. It requires uh, oxygen and its waste products are CO2 and water. And then it can use as fuels either the byproducts of uh, glycolysis uh, pyruvic acid from glycolysis or it can use fatty acids or amino acids. And then our third process is phosphorylation of ADP from glycolysis which can come from glucose from the blood supply or glucose that's derived from glycogen within the muscle cell and glycogen is just a polymer of glucose. Um, breaking it down, chewing up the glucose to make ATP which can then be used to fuel the metabolic processes of the cell. So three different mechanisms and it turns out that the phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate is found in all muscle cells. It's your first backup no matter what kind of muscle cell you have. The oxidative phosphorylation is found in oxidative muscle cells, so slow oxidative muscle cells or fast oxidative glycolytic muscle cells and then the Phosphor, the phosphorylation of ADP by glycolysis is found in fast muscle cells or in the fast oxidative glycolytic muscle cells. So our three different muscle types are classified based on how fast the myosin can hydrolyze ATP and the major pathway they use to form ATP. So slow oxidative, red muscle cells, they tend to be small in diameter primarily because they need to have efficient transport of oxygen across the full width of the muscle cell. There, then there's fast oxidative and it can also be called fast oxidative glycolytic because in addition to using oxidative metabolism these cells also use glycolytic metabolism 
these are red muscle cells which have intermediate diameters. They're a little bigger than the slow oxidative cells. And because they're a little bigger, the larger the diameter of the cell, the more force it can generate. They're bigger, they're stronger um, than the slow oxidative cells. And then the fast glycolytic are the largest. This tends to be white muscle, large diameter cells, and the stronger of the three different types because they tend to have larger diameters. Larger diameters, more myofibrils, more myofibrils, more force. Now the slow oxidative fibers, the myosin hydrolyzes ATP relatively slowly, which means the cycling of the crossbridge cycle is relatively slow. Um, they, because they're small in diameter, they make less tension and they're least likely to fatigue. Uh, the fast oxidative make a moderate amount of tension and they're moderately likely to fatigue. The fast glycolytic make more tension because they're bigger cells and they are most likely to fatigue rapidly. If we were to stimulate a slow oxidative fiber for a long period of time we would find that it could continue to make its maximum force for the entire period of the stimulation. However, if we stimulate a fast oxidative fiber what we find is that as the stimulation period increases, the ability to maintain maximum tension decreases and eventually you get a fatigued fiber that cannot produce the same amount of force even though it's being stimulated at the same rate. This is due to the metabolism of the cell and not due to any problem with stimulation typically. With a fast glycolytic fiber what you find is it makes the force that is made is large initially but the fatigue is rapid and it cannot continue working for long periods of time. Uh, it needs a r significant rest period in order to return to its uh, maximum force levels. This next slide just shows all the same information but in overlay. So here's the response of the slow oxidative fibers and then there's the response of the fast oxidative fibers and finally the response of the fast glycolytic fibers and you can see um, how the relative amounts of tension are different as well as the time in which the muscle starts to show fatigue is different based on the muscle type. So what causes fatigue? Uh, lactic acid has been the primary um, fall guy for this problem for many years. However, in recent years the research has shown that the accumulation of lactic acid does not cause fatigue. We know that it's not an absence of ATP because if it was an absence of ATP you'd, the muscle would go into rigor mortis and die. Uh, so it's not an absence of ATP. Um, each muscle contraction causes uh, the uh, release of ca uh, potassium from the intracellular environment to the extracellular environment. Uh, you know already that if you get high extracellular potassium then that can reduce the uh, resting membrane potential or make the resting membrane potential more towards zero uh, which would reduce cellular excitability. Um, it's been shown that the buildup of ADP and phosphate can inhibit the crossbridge cycling so the products of muscle contraction if they are allowed to accumulate within the cytoplasm can actually slow the cycling of myosin which could cause less force even though you have maximal stimulation. And then um, disruption of calcium regulation. This is a um, theory that is gaining some steam that as muscle cells activation proceeds you can get uh, some activation of calcium activated proteases which can damage muscle cells and it limits the response to repeating stimulation. Now we should also point out that there's two different kinds of fatigue. There's central fatigue. Central fatigue means that it has to do with the central nervous system, likely to have a lot to do with psychological effects uh, or will to continue to exercise um, or uh, exert energy. Or it could have to do with re protective reflexes, that is uh, your body um, has some built-in programming that understands that when you're tired you're more likely to injure yourself and so as you get more tired it uh, exerts less force or less um, response because it's trying to protect you from um, that uh, fatigue causing an injury. Now the other type of fatigue is peripheral fatigue and it could have to do with factors at the neuromuscular junction at 
uh, involving excitation contra contractions, coupling, uh, calcium signaling, or the contraction relaxation uh, metabolism. When we consider the factors determining muscle tension, we've considered everything in box one. It's now time to focus on the second box, number of active fibers, and we introduce the concept of motor units and active motor units. So what's a motor unit? A motor unit is a somatic motor neuron and its muscle fibers. And in this example, we show that the cell bodies of these motor neurons are in the um, spinal cord, that the axons extrude out to the periphery, and they connect with a specific population of muscle cells so that when the green axon is stimulated, it only activates the muscle fibers on which it synapses, and when the purple axon is stimulated, it only activates the cells that it is synapsing on. And so by choosing which motor neurons are active, the brain and the nervous system have the capacity to regulate how much force is generated by activating one motor unit or two motor units and they can activate motor units that contain few fibers or motor units that contain uh, large multitudes of fibers. The larger the motor unit, the more fibers that are, are activated by the uh, motor neuron, the more force will be produced by that particular stimulation. So when you recruit uh, motor units, you can increase the amount of force that is generated. So two motor units can generate more tension than one, and when a large amount of tension is, needs to be generated, you need to recruit more muscle fibers and therefore more motor units. Now, as we said earlier, the slow oxidative fibers tend to be smaller and therefore produce less force, and the fast uh, oxidative glycolytic and the fast glycolytic are larger, so therefore make more force. And so in humans, because of the mixture of uh, different fiber types in each of our muscles, there is an order to the recruitment and it has to do with how they can contribute to force production. In general, if the mass that needs to be moved or the tension that needs to be generated is low, you would recruit only the small, slow oxidative motor units. If you needed more force, then the next recruited size fiber would be the fast oxidative fibers, which would add the force that they can contribute to the force that's already being contributed by the slow oxidative fibers. And only when you need maximal forces do you recruit the fast glycolytic, which gets the largest muscle fibers, which many more fibers per motor unit and generate tension more quickly, and they add to the force that's already being generated by the less fatigable slow oxidative and fast oxidative fibers so that you get a larger amount of tension total. So in order of recruitment, small fibers first, intermediate fibers next, largest fibers last. Characteristics here, slow oxidative fibers, small diameter, fewer myofibrils, slow myosin, so tension and development is slow, mostly oxidative metabolism, many mitochondria, and in association with lots of capillaries. We would call this dark meat. These muscles are relatively resistant to fatigue. If we add to that population the fast oxidative fibers or fast oxidative glycolytic, we find that they have a larger diameter so they can generate more tension. They have more myofibrils. They have a faster myosin ATPase, so tension development is also faster. They use oxidative phosphorylation, which requires oxygen. Uh, they have mitochondria and capillaries to provide oxygen, but they also use glycolysis. They're somewhat resistant to fatigue. And then the largest muscle fibers, the fast glycolytic fibers, larger in diameter and more tension. The myosin is very fast, so tension development is very fast. Mostly glycolytic metabolism does not require molecular oxygen. 
They can contain glycogen to provide a reservoir for, of glucose for fuel production. Rarely have very many capillaries or mitochondria. Small amounts of myoglobin, we would call these white meat, but they are more prone to fatigue. This table from the book summarizes many of the characteristics of these three primary muscle types. Now you'll find if you go and study muscle in more detail that there are many uh, sort of um, tweaks of the muscle system. So it's not just three, but these three are the primary three uh, categories of muscle cells. You'll find uh, perhaps based on the speed of the myosin contraction, there's some fast fibers that are slower than other fast fibers, uh, but still all fast fibers are faster than the slow oxidative fibers. Uh, but review this table to compare the qualities of the three major types. Thank you for your attention.